All right, this is part three of Unit 5, and in this one we're going to talk about the Punic Wars, which established Rome as the, the dominant military and culture in the Mediterranean region. And then uh, we're going to talk about how it transitions from being the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire. And it's going to involve some pretty famous people, like maybe you've heard of them, like Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, Cleopatra. Yeah, all those guys are going to play a role in this. So I uh, hope you enjoy the video. It's a little long. I apologize, but it's probably the longest video of the unit. All right, take it easy. This is Unit 5, Part 3. We're going to be talking about the Punic Wars and the loss of the Roman Republic. I feel like we should have dramatic music here. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, maybe not. All right, here's our SOL, and again, we're going to talk about the events that lead to the Roman military dominating the Mediterranean basin uh, and Western Europe, the spread of the culture to the other areas, talking about how the impact of the military uh, will have uh, social impact on uh, Rome and its economy, and then talking about how Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar uh, sort of lead it becoming uh, an empire. Uh, stop being a republic and become an empire. Okay, first the Roman military. In the early days of Rome, uh, the, the army was incredibly strong. And the main reason was is that every male was expected to serve in the military. And so there were lots of people who were involved uh, with the military at this point, And each of them belonged to a legion. A legion was usually made up of 6,000 men, and then they were divided into even smaller units of 60 to 120 men. Now, uh, most Roman soldiers had SPQR tattooed into their arm, which meant uh, the uh, Senate and the people for Rome uh, is basically what it translates to. And uh, the Romans did not use the phalanx. They thought that it was far too slow a formation, and uh, they used multiple formations and would go around people. One formation that they did use to stop uh, armies that had archers was the testudo, or turtle formation. And basically, all the soldiers on the outside would hold their shields down, and the soldiers on the inside would hold it above their head, so it looked like a giant turtle. And uh, hopefully we're going to get into talking a little bit more about like the Roman uh, weaponry that they use, like the pilum and uh, their swords and some different stuff like that. Okay, so the Romans really do start to conquer the people around them initially. And uh, they treated the people that they conquered pretty well after the, the battle was over. Some were given partial rights. And, and many of the places that they conquered were eventually even given citizenship and considered Roman citizens. Uh, and the big thing that you need to know is that the Romans set up permanent military settlements throughout Italy, and they called them coloniae, and they built a road system to connect these colonies. And that's important because as they go to these places, they leave these military settlements. They have an incredible impact on the cultural diffusion of the areas. Uh, Roman culture and then eventually Catholic church culture are going to be spread because of the Roman settlements that are throughout Europe. All right, so we want to talk about the wars that lead to Rome becoming the dominant place in the area. There are two uh, things that you have to know. The first is, of course, Rome uh, was very, very jealous of another city that was located in northern Africa called Carthage. Uh, Carthage was an incredible trade city. Uh, it was set up by the Phoenicians, the same ones who created the alphabet, and uh, Rome was in competition for them with trade, and so they decided they didn't like Carthage. They were going to do something about it. And, uh, by the way, the, the Romans called the Carthaginians the Punici, which was short for Phoenicians. So how does the war start? Uh, in 264 BC, the Romans block the Strait of Messina, and uh, it starts a war. And uh, the Romans knew that it would. And for years and years and years, the, the Romans have an incredible advantage on land, but the Carthaginians have an advantage at sea. 
And then finally, the Romans catch a break that a Roman, uh, that a Carthaginian ship crashes on their shore. They build their ships on a similar format, but they add something. They they add a plank uh, to to throw down. And if you see the picture here, uh, this plank, they would spin it around and they would let it drop into the uh, the deck of the Phoenician boats or the Carthaginian boats and then they would storm across these boarding planks and it would be like a land battle on sea where the uh, Romans knew they would have a tremendous advantage. So uh, in 241 uh, Carthage is losing really badly and so they basically surrender uh, but Rome forces them to pay an indemnity and an indemnity is when you make the, the people who uh, you're fighting against pay for the damages of the war. Okay, so this established Rome as the dominant culture in the, uh, the Mediterranean. And uh, as you can see down here on the map, there's Carthage uh, on northern Africa. And uh, if you look up, there's Rome. You can see they're pretty close to one another uh, geographically. But for years, this war uh, is no problem. Another 20 or so years, uh, they pretty much get along peacefully. Both go back to trading and doing their things. And then in 221 BC, there is a Carthaginian general named Hannibal. He is in charge of one of their colonies in Spain. And he hated the Romans. He had vowed to his father, who had fought in the First Punic War, that he would get revenge on the Romans. And so he's going to set out to do that. The first thing that Hannibal does is in 218, he attacks a Roman ally city that's located in Spain and he defeats them easily and then he says hey you know what how about if I just invade you know Italy and go get them but I'm gonna do a sneak attack he decides to cross the Alps and he has 40,000 soldiers and 40 elephants uh, he doesn't take some things into account when he crosses the Alps there are mountain people who don't want visitors elephants are warm-blooded animals and the Alps get really really cold uh, there's not enough food and supplies so by the time he gets across he has 20,000 soldiers and about just a handful of elephants uh, left to do his fighting. So you would think the smart thing would probably be to turn around, but he doesn't. Uh, he will face a Roman army with 80,000 soldiers at Cannae, and that was in 216 BC. And here's the amazing thing. Hannibal was a brilliant general. He defeats the Romans and then basically runs wild in Italy for 13 years. He never directly attacks Rome itself, but he causes problems for the Romans in Italy. And he keeps hoping that Carthage will send him reinforcements, but they never do. If they did, it certainly could have probably changed things around because he was having a great deal of success. So finally, the Romans put a general in charge named Scipio. Scipio Africanus is what he is known as, and he is a really smart general himself. And so he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get Hannibal out of Italy. We're going to attack uh, Carthage itself, and we're going to make sure that Hannibal knows about it. So they start to send their, sh their ships and their soldiers to Carthage, and they f let Hannibal know that it's happening. And, and Hannibal is going to rush to try to defend Carthage. And when he gets there, his soldiers are exhausted from marching to get there and doing everything else. And, of course, uh, the Romans are waiting on him. And Hannibal is defeated at Zama in 202 B.C. After this war, Carthage, Carthage is destroyed economically and militarily. Uh, they have no chance of being competition for Rome. So, you would think that it would be over, but of course it's not. In the Third Punic War, what happens is, after 50 years of peace, Rome is having incredible economic problems, and the Senate is being blamed for a lot of this. So one senator comes up with the idea, hey, let's blame Carthage for this. Uh, they're, you know, they were really no threat to the, uh, to the Romans at this point, but, you know, who cares? We'll throw the blame on them, and then everyone will do it. So they start holding speeches saying, hey, the reason we're having all these problems, it's Carthage's fault. That's who we need to blame. 
And so when public opinion turns against Carthage, Rome attacks and they will burn the city and sell all the people into slavery. The legend is, is that they hated Carthage so much that they plowed salt into the soil. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? Yeah. So that no one could ever grow crops there again. Okay, so on your notes, I would like for you to explain uh, why the Punic Wars were so important to Rome becoming the dominant force in the Mediterranean region. And you'll do it right here on your notes. All right, so after this, of course, Rome has total control of the Mediterranean region. Victory in the wars allowed Rome to spread their culture and control trade in the region. Uh, the Mediterranean basin is totally under the control of Rome at this point. That means Africa, Asia, Europe, including the Hellenistic world of the Eastern Mediterranean uh, with Greece and Anatolia. Uh, Western Europe, Gaul, uh, which is today France, and the British Isles are eventually going to come under Roman control. But the wars also created economic issues at home that are going to be really, really big. So here's what happens that's really interesting. Because of the wars, many of the farmers who had fought in the war uh, are not going to be able to maintain their farms. And what's happened while they're away fighting is that the farmers, uh, that many of the richer senators who didn't fight in the wars, had paid to buy up land and created these huge, huge estate farms called Latifundia. And they used slave labor. And they had grain and cattle. And so the f small farmers who had been fighting were forced out of business. And so where are they going to turn? Okay, they decide to go to Rome. So they move from the country to the city. They get bread for really cheap, and they have free entertainment. Now, if you look over to the right, that is the necklace that a Roman slave would wear. You can see it has a stone tablet on the end with the rope necklace. Uh? I was supposed to do a sound effect there. It's not doing it. Okay, so now some people do try to reform Roman society. The first are the brothers Gracchi. Okay, Tiberius Gracchus was a tribune. Even though he was a patrician, the plebeians trusted him so much that they elected him tribune. And he said that we should limit the size of the lot to Fundia. And because of this, the Senate, yes, the Senate, think about this in today's world. The Senate rioted and killed Tiberius and 300 of his followers. That doesn't sound very democratic, does it? Then, ten years later, Gaius Gracchus starts talking some of the same ideas as his brother, and he is also going to be killed. Now, some of the other reformers had some ideas as well. One was a General Marius. Uh, he decided, and he made this recommendation, that they put the army in to uh, put them to work to... Uh, for 10 years and at the end of that 10 years you would give them land as a payment for that and uh, the Senate rejects the idea and so Marius says hey I own a lot of land I'm gonna create my own army and so he does but there's another general Sulla who does the same thing and these two dislike each other terribly uh, and so they start basically like almost a mob war between the two where one group is killing Marius uh, goes to war uh, with this and uh, Sulla tries to kill members of the Assembly of Tribes to strengthen the Senate and uh, of course 
Marius is trying to kill members of the Senate to, to strengthen the Assembly of Tribes. It's a vicious circle. And uh, Julius Caesar was actually almost assassinated himself because of this. So speaking of Caesar, how does all this go down with Caesar? Caesar was not uh, really wealthy when he started to come into power. He was a patrician, but he was sponsored by another gentleman named Crassus. I certainly know how to compliment a We're going to skip that sound file. But uh, he basically forms a triumvirate with Crassus and another famous Roman general named Pompey. So they have a rule by three people. That means a triumvirate is a rule by three. And he first serves as consul. But remember, consuls only serve for a year. And at the end of that year, Caesar appoints himself the governor of Gaul. And while there, he proves to be a brilliant, brilliant general. His, his legions conquer the Celtic people of Gaul. And he forces the leader, Vercingetorix, to go back to Rome as a prisoner. And while he's there, he gets rich. But Caesar's really smart. He keeps sending money back to the poor people of uh, Rome. And uh, because of that, the common people love Caesar. The people who don't like Caesar, though, are the Senate. They feel that Caesar is getting too powerful. And so what happens is Caesar's best friend Crassus dies. And then Pompey, his other partner, uh, has several tragic events happen. Pompey was actually married to Caesar's daughter, but she died in childbirth, and that had an impact on Pompey as well. But then uh, the Senate convinces uh, Pompey that Caesar is getting too powerful. They send him a letter to tell him to disband his legions and return to Rome. And so Caesar decides to keep his army together, and he takes them across the Rubicon River. The minute that he does this, it's seen as treason by the Senate, and it starts a civil war. And to make a long story short, Caesar wins the battle. Pompey will be killed by an Egyptian pharaoh, and then Caesar will have his persons killed. It's a really cool story. I'll tell you more about it in class uh, with Caesar. But now Caesar is the of Rome. Okay, so by 45 BC, he is named dictator of life, and he has many accomplishments. He uh, helps employ the poor people. He uh, creates government projects and government jobs, and uh, he establishes the Julian calendar. And he's feeling pretty invincible. I am invincible! Invincible! You ow! And that's what happens. Now, whether you thought Caesar was a leader or a tyrant, as he goes to the Senate chambers on March 15, 44 BC, known as the Ides of March, his key people are distracted, and when he goes into the Senate chambers by himself, he is attacked by a group of senators led by Marcus Brutus and Cassius, and they stab Caesar to death. Say hello to my new friend. So once again, Rome is going to be thrown into chaos. For a short time afterwards, the Republic is reestablished, but it'll be short-lived because civil war will come again, and uh, a second triumvirate led by Caesar's grand-nephew and adopted son, Octavian, and Mark Antony, his top general, and a third soldier named Lepidus, they assassinate uh, over 200 senators, and another civil war ensues. And then at the end of that, these three will rule over Rome. Eventually, though, Lepidus is forced to retire, and Mark Antony, after a series of public embarrassments, is sent to Egypt. Now, by the way, keep in mind, and we'll get to this, Mark Antony is married to Octavian's sister. So, while Mark Antony is in Egypt, Egypt, he falls for Queen Cleopatra. Now, Cleopatra had also already been involved and had a son with Julius Caesar. So, you know, those Romans were getting busy. You know how it works. And he sends his sister back, uh, Octavian's sister back to Rome and says he's leaving her. And uh, remember, that's going to start another war. And eventually, Cleopatra and Mark Antony are going to be defeated in a sea battle. And what happens is, 
Anthony sip ship sinks. Cleopatra goes back to the to the Capitol building and she thinks that it's over. Mark Antony thinks that Cleopatra has abandoned him and she, he throws himself on his own sword. So then in comes Octavian and says, hey, you know, I'm going to take you back as a prisoner. Cleopatra says, hey, I, I need to prepare Mark Antony's body for burial. We need to give that. He fought bravely for Caesar. And, and uh, Octavian agrees. And so when they bring in stuff for the body, uh, Cleopatra's attendants bring in several baskets to prepare Antony's body, and in one of them is a poisonous snake, which is called an asp, and Cleopatra allows it to bite her and kill her. And so they are both, their bodies are taken back. You know what Cleopatra died of, right? A pain in the asp. <laughs> so anyhow, the bodies are taken back and put on display as being traitors. And what you need to know is this is the start of the Roman Empire. Octavian changes his name to Augustus Caesar, which means majestic one. He is the first emperor, an absolute ruler. Ruler, And here's what's interesting. They didn't kill Octavian when they killed Caesar because they thought that he was weak. And he will be one of the greatest rulers of Roman history. He will build it into the Roman Empire and make the city incredible. And he will rule for 40 years. Okay, so now on your notes, I need you to fill in this chart right here, which completes the different governments of Rome. You go from monarchy to where it's going to end up. There's a couple of things to fill in there. All right, and then I want you to analyze how Caesar's life changed Rome's government. What was it when Caesar started? What was it after his death with the civil wars? Okay, that's it for your notes. Okay, so what are the big ideas of this video? All right, victory in the Punic Wars allows Rome to dominate the region culturally, politically, and economically, but it also adds to major economic problems for the government. Many factors lead to the decline of the Roman Republic, and the actions of Julius Caesar and others lead Romans to develop a conquering empire.